Israel has begun expanding its military operations inside Gaza as it seeks to wipe out Hamas. We will go live to the Middle East shortly for the latest. The worsening crisis there could have been a reason to delay or scale back Anthony Albanese's visit here to Washington. Instead, Joe Biden laid on the warmest of welcomes for his Australian ally. It was a demonstration that despite all that's going on in the world, the US president isn't taking his eye off the Indo-Pacific, drawing Australia closer and warning his counterpart to be wary of China. On Saturday, the Prime Minister heads to Beijing, the first Australian leader to do so in seven years. But before then, he spent the week here trying to cement the AUKUS deal with members of Congress and broadening the relationship into all sorts of new areas. We're going to come to the situation in the Middle East and the difficult politics around that in Australia, but we're going to start with the outcomes of this official Prime Ministerial visit to the US Capitol. A very warm Washington welcome to our panel, Anthony Galloway, Anna Henderson and Greg Jennett. Great to have you all here. And the weather's uh, turned on a treat uh, for us. In fact, Greg, you were saying earlier, is this the warmest Washington day for this date Fun ever? fact, it is for this day. Uh, talking in Celsius, which no one does in the United States of America, topped out at 28 and the warmest before that was 25. But I'm going to start out, David, by saying what I know we're all thinking. What a time and what a place yeah. uh, to be this week with so many undercurrents, not just the Middle East that you're talking about. Yeah. Uh, the Prime Minister's visit alone would have been enough to sink our teeth into, but uh, so much more with China. Look, there's a lot to get through. Let's talk about what the PM's been doing, though, and in many ways, um, it's, it's, it's notable that this went ahead at all. I mean, President Biden could have delayed or scaled right down this official visit, Anna, because of what's going on in the Middle East, but he, but he didn't. As I mentioned earlier, he really laid it on and made it as uh, the welcome as warm as he could. It goes back to the fact that the United States wasn't able to come for the Quad meeting. The President knows that he made this commitment that Anthony Albanese was going to get this state visit and once the ball was rolling it really was very difficult for that not to go ahead. So much work had gone into it yeah. and at the same time there was this idea that having solidarity with an ally, life going on and having these engagements could actually help the US. And Anthony is also about showing um, Australia China, the world, that despite all of this, Biden still has his eye on the Indo-Pacific. Yeah, absolutely. On the Australian side, there was serious concern in recent weeks that this would be cancelled or that key kind of portions of the trip, such as the state dinner, would be cancelled. As we saw, it was kind of toned down a bit with the B-52s not playing. But, um, I mean, Albanese and his team would be very content with how it went in terms of... Um, they don't put on state visits for everyone. It's this a lot the, of pomp this and was ceremony. the fourth that the Biden administration's done. Exactly, exactly. So they only really put it on for, for key allies. So it went on without, without a hitch. But, I mean, there was the Israel-Hamas war as the backdrop. It's the only thing in this town that people are really caring about at the moment. Yeah, understandably. Uh, let's just look, though, at what did come out of the trip. There were uh, a bunch of announcements, I suppose you could call them fairly modest. Uh, they went to things like critical minerals, artificial intelligence, cyber security, space cooperation. I guess, Greg, the idea is to show that it's in a relationship more than just submarines. So it was cast by the Prime Minister as a theme of future alliance, redesigning uh, the last 72 years for presumably the next century or so. Now there is a modest nature to a lot of the individual initiatives if you look at them. That's true. It's almost like all the departments and agencies were told to trawl their files with anything <laughs> Come up with, with the word Australia in it and that made it into this really lengthy uh, compendium of initiatives that's out there. One worth highlighting though which I think or I presume will be warmly welcomed in our region is this multi-million dollar, $65 million US going into a Pacific Islands fibre network for the internet and other forms of telecommunications. That's along with Google and other, uh, other telco companies. The sort of thing, it is interesting, the sort of thing I suppose that um, China's trying to do as well in the Pacific rollout, internet cables and... Uh, that yeah. telecommunications issue, which I think Australia and the US have realised, if you connect these nations and if you provide their lifeline and if you provide a way for them to come into the you know first world economy that's a that pays a big dividend yeah and on critical minerals an extra two billion dollars from the Australian government announced to top up um, what's called the critical minerals facility encourage uh, more investment in critical minerals but the, the climate groups in Australia were pretty underwhelmed with that one they were. I mean, that was all about, uh, you know, a fair bit of concern with the US Inflation Reduction Act, sucking capital 
out of of Australia. This Which is Al on a whole other scale. This is on a whole other scale, but this is about Albanese saying, you know, it's, all of this stuff has to be kind of mutually beneficial. We need to work together on a lot of these And on, on space, what did they agree there? Yeah, so a space agreement to um, for, for American companies to essentially launch from Australia. But I'm picking up a bit of criticism in the industry because just in the last budget, uh, uh, the Albanese government cut the $1.2 billion space program. So that's a bit jarring. Uh, we're essentially saying to the Yanks, you can use us as a launching pad, but we're not really developing a lot of sovereign capability in, in this area. There's a bit of a watch this space here as well, uh, because some of the areas that uh, NASA has been looking at and that the US has been looking at to, to do this work on space, um, on the future of that in Australia does have some issues with native title agreements. How that's going to play out, I'm not sure, but it is something that possibly will come up in the next few weeks. All right, so they were all the sort of smaller announcements during the week, but clearly there was a big focus on AUKUS and getting that deal done, which it still hasn't been in the building behind us uh, in Congress. We're going to come back to where things are at now on this AUKUS deal after the Prime Minister's visit and what he wants to achieve in China next week as well. First, let's hear from Anthony Albanese. I spoke to the Prime Minister at Blair House across the road from the White House before he left Washington. Prime Minister, thanks so much for giving us some time here in Washington. Wonderful to be here. You've spent a fair bit of time over the last few days with President Biden and it seems pretty much every time he's appeared alongside you he's said something about China, expressing concerns about China or the Indo-Pacific, even uh, warning you about trusting China. Why do you think that is? Well what we have is in President Biden's own words yesterday, uh, we want competition but without conflict. So the strategic competition in our region between the United States and China, the two great powers in global politics, is just a factor. It's a factor in our region and it's something that uh, is uh, some of the backdrop, if you like, to all of the, the relationships which are there. It's a, a clearly a concern for President Biden. I mean, do you trust China? Well, what we need to acknowledge is that uh, we have different political systems and different values. But what I say is that we'll cooperate where we can, uh, we will disagree where we must, and we'll engage in our national interests. And that's something that uh, President Biden also supports. Uh, my concern uh, with the relationship between the United States and China is that there has been uh, good, good engagement at the diplomatic level, at senior uh, ministerial level equivalent in Australian terms, uh, but uh, military to military there's still a lack of engagement. We need to build in guardrails as I spoke at the Shangri-La dialogue in June in Singapore. And so do you see Australia playing a role in helping that dialogue? I think uh, both China and the United States probably see Australia as playing a role. We're, we're a middle power. So uh, an, in, an in between? Well, we're a middle power. We're clearly, uh, our allies uh, is very clear. Uh, we have an alliance with the United States. We're a strategic partner with the United States. Uh, but we're also a player in the region. We'll host uh, ASEAN leaders in March next year. And I think that Australia's word is very important uh, in the world. We've participated uh, in, as a G20 member, but we also participate in forums like the G7 and NATO. But I'm just interested in what you said there. Do you see Australia as a go-between the two big powers? Well, not, not so much a go-between because it's clear where we stand as a democratic nation. Uh, but uh, we are a nation that does engage in our own interests. We're a sovereign country, uh, but uh, the relationship with China is obviously important for Australia. They're our major trading partner. Uh, something like uh, one in four of our export dollars uh, comes from China. Uh, but the United States, of course, is our largest two-way investment partner. So our economic relationships are important, and historically uh, we have had a, a, a relationship with China. I will visit, of course, next month. What do you want to achieve with that visit? Just opening up that engagement. Uh, very clearly, it's in Australia's interest to engage with China as our major uh, source of our, our trade. 
Uh, we've seen major breakthroughs when it comes to removing some of the impediments that have been there for trade. The wine decision alone uh, will be worth uh, around about $1.2 billion to Australia. Barley was worth $900 million to Australia. We've had decisions on, on timber, on hay, and on other products. So this, there, is, all, this is all good there's news. There's more to do. This is the, where you can cooperate, as you say, but as you say, you also want to be able to disagree where you must. Where, well, we, where we, do you disagree? We, we disagree on the basis of our political systems, on issues like human rights, on issues such as uh, access to uh, the South China Sea, the East China Sea, the, the Taiwan Straits. We think that uh, the uh, UN Convention on the Law of the Sea allowing for that free flow of trade uh, through those waterways are very important uh, for Australia. Obviously, uh, there have been issues there. Uh, there are issues of human rights uh, where we have different positions and we'll put those positions uh, strongly, uh, clearly, and uh, directly uh, to China. And I think that's the way that you build a relationship though, is to have that, those straight talks. And I believe Australia's in a position to do so. What about China's role on the world stage? Uh, Xi Jinping's just hosted Vladimir Putin in Beijing. He's refusing to condemn Hamas. Are those things you'll raise? Uh, absolutely. Uh, we have a very different position uh, when it comes to uh, the, the actions of a terrorist group like Hamas and we've seen the, the dreadful consequences. Uh, the consequences of the Russian invasion of Ukraine uh, continue to reverberate around supermarket shelves in Australia. So Australia needs to engage with the world. We need to have a seat at the table and my government's determined to do so. Now, um, I want to ask you about the state of democracy here in the United States. Um, you've been watching it up close uh, and, and involved in it this week. Um, the, House finally appointed a new speaker uh, while you've been here. Uh, this is someone who did fight pretty hard to overturn Joe Biden's election win. He's known as a, a leading election denier, as they call it here in, in Washington. Does that concern you that there's a, a speaker of the House who doesn't necessarily accept Joe Biden's election win? And how fragile is democracy in the United States? Well, it's important that democracy be not just supported, but be nourished, if I can put it that way. And uh, Australia's position is very clear. Uh, the decisions for the United States Congress, of course, are a matter for them. It's a good thing that uh, Speaker Johnson uh, has been uh, elected. Uh, I'll be meeting with him today, and I very much look forward to that. Uh, I've met uh, during this week with various uh, Congress and, and Senate members and all of them have been uh, very supportive of AUKUS. At the event uh, last night, there were a range of Congress and Senate leaders uh, there. It was an opportunity to make sure that, that they understand how important the AUKUS relationship is for Australia. But clearly, Joe Biden has concerns about Donald Trump, the things he's saying and the influence that he has on the Republican Party. Uh, you know, he's, he's worried that the things that Trump says are a threat to democracy. Does that worry you about this, this powerful democracy actually being a threat? Well, this is a great democracy and uh, it's a great democracy that doesn't need uh, the outside commentary about their internal affairs from the Australian Prime Minister. Do you worry though uh, about what a, a second Trump presidency might look, mean for the alliance, for the world? I, I, I work with uh, President Biden uh, very closely. Uh, we have developed a, a great friendship. We now have uh, met on nine occasions, uh, having not just one dinner at the White House, but two the, the previous uh, two evenings. I mean, and that, that relationship's clear, but, but he says world leaders are always raising with him concerns about Trump. Are you? Well, what I do in private meetings is, uh, is keep uh, those meetings private. You, you won't be reading my text messages uh, with other world leaders. What about AUKUS? Let me ask you whether there's been much progress this week in the various meetings that you've held. Are you any more confident that the legislation will be passed by Congress by the end of the year to allow AUKUS to proceed? I'm very confident. And across the board, uh, there has been extraordinary level of support. I think President Biden's initiative in, in sending 
a bill uh, to uh, Congress uh, with uh, three, uh, more than $3 billion uh, attached to it to help with the industrial capacity uh, to uh, build the, the, the base uh, here for submarines is very important uh, as well and will alleviate some concern that was there from some US legislators that somehow the assistance to Australia would detract from the industrial base for the United States. Are you willing, I think that's been dealt with. Are you willing to top up Australia's contribution, which is $3 billion as well, to the US submarine production base? Now, our, our contribution is appropriate and it's a good thing uh, that the United States has uh, contributed uh, as well to alleviate any concern uh, which is there. Look, this is, this is of major benefit, uh, not just to uh, the, the workers and the base there at, at Virginia and other places, but of course, particularly for South Australia and Western Australia. This will be a jobs bonanza, and it will do more than the direct jobs as well. A bit like the former auto industry did, you'll see that multiplier. And there is, uh, this is uh, highly, highly advanced uh, manufacturing for Australia uh, will reap the benefit for decades to come. Final one, uh, Prime Minister, did you raise the case of Julian Assange with the President at all this week? Uh, I raised uh, the issue of Julian Assange with the administration on all of the occasions in which I've met members of the administration. Including the President? Uh, I, I raised it with the President on a range of occasions. Uh, what about this week though? Uh, yes, I have. And, and, what, did, and what did he and, say? Well, we, we keep our discussions private. Uh, I make clear Australia's position that I made as Labor leader, it's the same position I hold as Prime Minister, which is that enough is enough. It is time that this issue was brought to a conclusion. It's time that Joe Biden stepped in and ordered the case be dropped? No, uh, Joe Biden doesn't interfere with the Department of Justice. Uh, Joe Biden is a president who understands the separation of the judicial system from the political system. That's an important principle. We just had a discussion about democracy and the nature of it. So is it time for a plea deal? Well, we, the uh, Australian officials are working very hard. Uh, to achieve an outcome which is consistent uh, with the position that I've put. Prime Minister, thanks so much for joining us. Thanks, David. We'll come back to what the Prime Minister just said there on Julian Assange. Uh, he did raise it with the President, but not calling on him to intervene. And the comments on China uh, as well. He's going to raise, he said, strongly, clearly and directly uh, some difficult issues uh, in the relationship between Australia and China. We're back with our panel, Anthony Galloway, Anna Henderson, Greg Jennett. Um, let's just uh, get into the AUKUS um, deal and where that's at. We know the Prime Minister was well, hoping to address uh, Congress without a speaker, though, in time, that couldn't couldn't happen. But he did meet more than 50 members of Congress. Mm. Where is this up to? Because we know that the Biden administration's all in, no question about that. But legislation still has to pass through here for the nuclear submarine technology to be transferred to Australia. So what's happening? It's very complicated. So just as Albanese was jetting off, the, the um, Congressional Budget Office released a report which was absolutely scathing of how the US industrial base has been uh, allowed to whittle down submarine building capacity. So they're now only building one and a half subs a year. Uh, they need to get up to 2.6 if they are to give us five of the Virginia class subs that uh, they kind of need to under the AUKUS agreement. So it's a big lift. Yes. And these problems were already there it's, before AUKUS came it, along. It's difficult to see how they get to 2.6 uh, next decade without a huge you know, injection of resources and funds. So you read Biden's uh, additional 3.4 billion, I think it is, um, commitment into that. But it's very complicated. That 3.4 billion is tied up in a $105 billion supplementary bill, which includes all kinds of military spending. Well, for money for Ukraine, Ukraine, money for Israel. Exactly. Now, you, the Ukraine war is an increasingly unpopular war here in, in America. So it's more complicated just than do members of Congress support AUKUS? Uh, uh, speaking to some people here, um, they reckon the members who are trying to squeeze more money out of either Joe Biden or, or Australia for that matter, um, they represent submarine making districts. They're always going to do that. This is politics, but it still needs to get done. Mm. Right, Anna, and it's not there yet. 
So there's this concern around what happens to the perception of US military capability and the reality of it. If something happens around Taiwan or the South China Sea, what has the US got at its disposal? How is Australia dragging capability away? And then there's also this reality which has been put to me time and time again at the highest levels here uh, on the Australian and the US side that Congress is a very difficult beast to wrangle, very unpredictable. All these other things can come into play. And while we heard very positive language from the Prime Minister and the President, I think behind the scenes there is an acknowledgement that it is, it's not a done deal and there's still a lot of unpredictable elements that could play out. Well, they say they're very confident though, Greg. They need this to be done, if not by the end of the year, by the end of January, because then we get into election year here and it gets more difficult. Where the attention of Joe Biden and, you know, most members on the Hill will be uh, falling elsewhere. But to Anna's point, there is a complexity and a subtlety here. I don't think we're going to find ourselves in a position where this is Republicans going one way, Democrats as a bloc going the other. The grey area in the middle here is people coming at this from all sorts of perspectives. Political, yes. China uh, dove, China hawk, fiscal conservative, those who would spend more on national security and national defence. And then there's another section as well who question the whole ethos of industry policy, government money targeting industries like this. So, look, I think there's a deal to be done there. I don't know whether it involves extra Australian money, but I can't see a split that has them uh, completely paralysed. No, it, and, yeah, sorry. It, it was probably important to note that AUKUS isn't kind of like a mainstream issue in Washington. No. Outside of the few Congress uh, members who have shipbuilding in their electorates or the Friends of Australia caucus, it's just not a top order issue for, for congressmen. So the AUKUS bills will probably be in what's called the National Defence Authorisation Act, which is kind of like the defence budget. Mm. Um, so it's, we it's really whether Congress can get its act together and pass, pass their next defence budget. Now, while he didn't get the chance to give an address to Congress. He did give a speech to the Prime Minister to the State Department. There were a bunch of members of Congress there, the Vice President, the Secretary, Secretary of State and, uh, and so on. He made a couple of interesting remarks there, I thought, in the speech. Um, on AUKUS he said, look, Australia doesn't have its hand out here. This is about us stepping up in the Indo-Pacific and collectively doing more. And a bit of a message, uh, it sounded to me, uh, to those more isolationist views in the United States. Those who feel, hey, why are we always, the, the Americans are always the ones that have to go out and solve the world's problems. Here's what the Prime Minister said. It is natural, indeed, it is understandable for some to greet any new call for American global engagement with why us, why now, why there, why again? But the promise of America has never been fulfilled in isolation. The greatness of America has never been confined to your borders. So is that a, a remark aimed, do you think, Greg, at the Trumpian um, side of the Republican Party? Yeah, it's that nationalist rather than, you know, America first rather than, you know, America yeah. taking a gle uh, global leadership role. I think that's where it was pitched and worthwhile doing that too because at its simplest we could analyse this whole mission by Anthony Albanese on AUKUS as trying to Trump proof it. And I mean that more in the, the sort of subtle ways that Republicans fall in Trump and non-Trumpian camps. So I think he's going to that point. Even if Donald Trump never, should he return as president, ever seriously wants to unsettle AUKUS, I think the messaging is to those who fall in behind him. Yeah, well, he certainly hasn't said, Donald Trump, that, you know, I don't think he said much about AUKUS, uh, that he'd tear it up. But, you know, there are mixed views and a little bit of uncertainty around what might happen, I suppose. So Trump proofing, I guess, is, is a good word for, to describe what they're trying to do. Look, China loomed over this whole week here in Washington. I mean, it's kind of the backdrop to the AUKUS deal as well, right? But it was striking, wasn't it, Anna, that every time, it seemed, the president was alongside Anthony Albanese, whether in the Oval Office, the joint press conference, even the toasts they made at the state dinner, those mm -hmm. friendly toasts, there were references to China and the Indo-Pacific by, uh, by Joe Biden. What was that all about? Well, it was, it was sometimes unprompted. Uh, sometimes obviously just something that the president wanted to bring into the conversation. It was often referencing conversations he'd had previously with President Xi. Well, just, just on that, lines. I'll just jump in there because he did, unprompted uh, in the Oval Office, make yeah. reference to a conversation with Xi Jinping. For context, when two leaders meet in the Oval Office, the media get shuffled in, you sort of jammed in nice and tight, capture a few minutes of back and forth for the cameras and then you get shuffled out while they c continue their private conversation. And in that time, Right at the end, 
Joe Biden clearly wanted to say this for the cameras to capture. Well, uh, I was asked by Xi Jinping a couple of years ago why I was working so hard with your country. We said, we're a Pacific nation. He looked at me and said, yeah, we're a Pacific nation in the United States. We are. We're going to stay there. It's a little hard to hear even in the room, right? A bit of a mumble there, but what was he saying? What was the point? Well, yes, firstly, we were all scrambling to try and check the transcript because we could tell it was very purposefully delivered, just uh, without uh, much clarity <laughs> from the audio. But yeah, this is, a, this is the US president once again making clear not only that the alliance with Australia is, as he says, the anchor point, uh, but that he has made it clear to China uh, how important the US sees the Pacific, the alliance with Australia and its place in the region. Yeah, and so the Prime Minister's comments in the interview we just heard there, Anthony, he's talking about Australia playing a role, he didn't like the word being a go-between, but playing a role in helping the US and China engage with each other. It should be pointed out there is a fair bit of engagement going on. China's foreign minister has, has just been here a couple of days ago. Absolutely, although I don't think China would view Australia as the honest broker that can kind of bring the US and, and China together. Because um, we're kind of seen as yes. America's best friend. Yes, exactly, exactly. So I'd love to know when um, the biden G conversation was actually. Was that shortly after August, just a couple of years ago, or was that when the two were vice presidents? That would that would be important context there. Yes. And I should, I should point out just, um, an, an interesting moment as we were at the State Department and the Prime Minister was delivering the speech he was going to give to Congress and he was with um, Kamala Harris and, and Blinken and they were all talking about how much they loved Australia. The State Department was preparing for Wang Yi to come in within a matter of an hour or so for his own visit. So these things were all happening in the same building. Yeah, exactly. I mean, I think in total, Wang Yi ended up spending, according to the State Department, seven and a half hours with Anthony Blinken and mm -hmm. his team. So, David, much has been made of the trust and verify warning uh, so described. That was the President's um, line in the press conference when asked, should we trust China? Yeah, and look, there is undoubtedly a message there about about hastening slowly in Australia's relationship with China. But to elaborate on the point, America is full speed ahead with its own bilateral relationship mm. with Beijing, including Governor of California, Gavin Newsom. He spent half the week in Beijing this week, covering all sorts of matters from human rights to trade and climate change. So, you know, I think they are not neophytes in this area. They understand and that we will have a relationship just as they have their own. And uh, there's expectations, at least, that uh, Joe Biden and Xi Jinping will meet uh, on the sidelines of the APEC summit here in the United States next month. We'll see. Um, as for the Prime Minister's visit to China, uh, heading his head, heads over there Saturday, from what he said, he does intend to speak, he said, uh, clearly, directly, and a bit of straight talk on some difficult issues, uh, whether that's human rights, South China Sea, but also China's support for Russia, its refusal to condemn Hamas, could be quite an interesting meeting. Very interesting. <laughs> Easy to say how tough you're going to talk in Washington. When you're sitting but here in yeah, Washington. yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but but um, yeah, very interesting that he's saying that now, and it'll be interesting how hard he goes on those points yeah. in his meetings with Xi. It's an interesting juggling act to do these two trips so close to one another. Yeah, it's the real balancing act, yeah. uh, isn't it? But at least engagement between the two leaders is a, is a good thing. They, they can talk to each other and try and normalise the relationship despite those difficulties. On Julian Assange, we heard the PM uh, confirm that yes, he raised this with Joe Biden. And it's interesting that he said, um, no, he's not expecting Biden to override or tell the, State, the Justice Department what to do. Absolutely. And we know that um, Gabriel Shipton, who is Julian Assange's brother, has been just behind us walking around Congress. Interestingly, he said in those meetings, often the, the, the people of the Congress buildings were actually quite appreciative to talk about the Assange issue just because Israel and Hamas had been at the front of the lobbying efforts. It was sort of a relief to Trump. talk about Julian yeah. Assange in some ways. They are expecting things could change in a matter of weeks in, terms of, in terms of whether he is uh, finally extradited. extradited. So it does appear urgent to them, or that's what they say. At the same time, they do take um, a lot of frustration in this idea that there is a plea deal to consider because they say he was never offered it, uh, and it, it's you know it's it's for them uh, doesn't feel fair that he you know it's it suggests a sense of victim blaming for his imprisonment in their view. Uh, however, it does seem very clear from that interview that. Uh, 
there is not going to be a, a push from the Australian side on the president to, to take some kind of action well, yeah, or I mean, pressure here. Greg, based on his comments um, that it's not for the president to interfere, why is he raising it with the president? Well, I think he's trying to signal, as others have before him, don't forget we had a parliamentary delegation working yeah. the hill here only a few only weeks, weeks ago. ago. Yeah. So I think it is fair to say, as the Prime Minister told you, David, Joe Biden doesn't interfere with the DOJ. He doesn't. And that's a point of principle that defines him against his Well, it also goes to uh, you know the criticism from the Trump side that all these legal, these criminal cases that he's confronting uh, are a political stitch-up. Joe Biden needs to be able to say... I I don't interfere with the Justice Department. Exactly, and I don't think he does. Merrick Garland, the Attorney General, has said the same. But that doesn't stop all these other messengers, and Anthony Albanese is but one of them, uh, using whatever channels you can to raise, to raise it. Well, and then, as your question alluded to, it looks like all roads do lead to you mentioned, plea bargaining. Yeah, perhaps. You mentioned Gabriel Shipton, Julian Assange's mm. brother. He has been here in Washington. Um, we actually bumped into him right near the White House where he had a small protest uh, set up. He does think Joe Biden Biden can and should be intervening. I believe that Joe Biden can make a call um, and it, his voice will carry uh, significantly with the, with the Justice Department. They won't act uh, un unless they get the go ahead from the president. So, uh, look, we'll, we'll see um, whether that you're sorry. I just want to point out one thing from uh, being here in Washington, speaking to members of Congress, including Thomas Massey, who is a Trump supporter on the Republican side, who is at the sort of spearhead of congressional messaging to the Biden administration to uh, not go ahead with the extradition and to drop the charges. So this idea that in some way those... Um, forces within, within the Democratic Party or, you know, politically that it could be a problem for President Biden isn't as clear as it may have appeared to be. Let's talk about uh, what's happening in the Middle East and what's happening politically as well around this. Mentioned earlier, there was a vote at the United Nations on a motion uh, calling for an immediate humanitarian truce in Gaza. 120 countries supported it. Uh, 14 voted against it, including the United States. Um, Australia abstained, was one of 45 countries to abstain. Uh, why, Anna, did we abstain from the vote? So it was seen as incomplete. Our representative to the UN said that they wanted to see uh, reference specifically to Hamas as the perpetrator, also language around Israel's right to self-defence, but that that needed to be contained. So, so the resolution didn't, didn't condemn Hamas at all? Not specifically in the way that the Australian uh, side would have liked it to. And, and so we took the decision to abstain, but not uh, to, to vote against in line with the United States in a week where the alliance is so close. Interesting to see. One point a difference. Exactly. Yeah, and Peter Dutton, uh, the opposition leader back home, has this morning said that Australia should have joined the United States and others in voting against this resolution. The Prime Minister had an opportunity here in the United Nations to send a clear message uh, about our values and where we stand, and he failed that test. And I think it was an incredibly weak display of leadership from the Prime Minister. America is our most important ally, particularly in an uncertain time. Uh, and to see the Prime Minister, uh, you know, parading around on, on the red carpet, but then squibbing it when it comes to the tough decisions, uh, I don't think that's in our country's best interest. So Peter Dutton saying we should have voted against. The Greens are saying Australia should have voted for the resolution. Um, it's, it's kind of uh, a demonstration, isn't it, Anthony, of the conundrum facing the Australian government. Uh, not that it's alone in this. I think it's mm. fair to say in, in the UK and here in the US, you've got these tensions as well over how to support Israel mm. while at the same time supporting civilian lives in Gaza. Yeah, they were gonna, going to be criticised by both sides for, for, for staining here. Yeah. I, I would say there's a growing theme here of Dutton uh, going, you know, criticising the Albanese government on foreign policy. He should have visited Israel on the way back from the US, now criticising a UN vote. Um, you know, he's quite happy to go there, isn't he? He's quite happy to go there. Um, you know, it's, it's, it's watch this space on that one, yeah. Yeah, and within the government, let's just explore uh, what the, the current view is in relation to what's happening in the Middle East. It was a really interesting um, uh, interview with Tony Burke on Radio National the other day with Patricia Carvelis. I mean, she asked him whether what Israel is doing uh, amounts to genocide. He wouldn't say no. He said, I don't want to get into the specific words around this. He argued uh, he supported very strongly a decision of a local council and his electorate to be flying the Palestinian flag. Here he was. It is not the Hamas flag that's flying. It's the Palestinian flag. 
And it's a flag that gives people the chance to know that there is recognition and not selective grief. We can't say we only grieve for certain people who are slaughtered. We can't have a situation as a nation where we only formally acknowledge particular deaths. Now, Jewish groups were highly critical of Tony Burke for those comments. What, how much division is there, Greg, at the moment within Labor over this? We're a long way from home, so I won't pretend to be dialled into everyone's thinking, but it's pretty palpable on the read of it from here that there is a division there. I think to a point that can be tolerated. What, after all, is the point of a diverse parliament, ethnically, religiously, uh, if you can't represent the views of pro-Palestinian communities as well as uh, Jewish and pro-Israeli ones? I think the problem arises when it starts to penetrate the cabinet and you're having public articulations of views. Tony Burke is but one, Ed Husick is another. That's something that's going to have to be watched and or managed by the Prime Minister. But the broader idea of differences that represent the community differences shouldn't be uh, unmanageable. I thought Husick's intervention was a lot more inappropriate. I mean, you are calling out, you're accusing Israel of war crimes without consulting DFAT, without any evidence that that was really... Of a, war crimes? Well, he accused them of collective like punishment and yeah. when it was written up by just about every... In the country, is, he is did not hose it down. So, so, yeah, I think NRLE and, and Ed Husick's um, intervention was you know, more out of step with actual, actual government policy than, than what was Burke. I mean, I, I'm hearing MPs, especially in Western Sydney, are uh, copying it from, from oh, yeah. uh, Muslim communities at the moment uh, over the government's position. It's almost worse that Anthony Albanese went to a mosque to campaign about the referendum just before mm. this all unfolded because it really did feel uh, in the feedback we were getting this heavy level of disappointment that when things first unfolded at least the language wasn't uh, inclusive enough in Australia. People in the Muslim community did feel attacked. There's still that messaging going out in Western Sydney. Local uh, politicians are very aware of it. On the Labor side and, you know, the question, I guess, is, well, if you're not happy with Labor, where would you go? Like, where would you put your vote? And apparently, um, you know, on an anecdotal level, we're hearing the discussion around don't vote at all, which would be very problematic for Labor. Yeah, yeah sure would. Look, a, a final one um, on a domestic issue back home. Well, in fact, it's not just a domestic issue at all, and that's inflation. But it's a huge political uh, sore for the government, we know, because the latest figures that came out the other day suggest that it's perhaps not coming down fast enough. So these were the September quarter figures. They do suggest now a, another interest rate rise on Melbourne Cup days, looking more and more likely. Um, what did the results show? It came in at 1.2% for the quarter. That's the trimmed mean inflation, which everyone looks at. It uh, strips away some of the volatility. 1.2%. That is above the Reserve Bank's forecast of 0.9%. Um, and the Reserve Bank governor had uh, said after their last meeting that there's, uh, they, they're going to take a low tolerance if inflation is not returning to forecast quickly enough. So they, they, that's why the concern is there. The Treasurer, however, uh, he insisted there was no material change in the inflation outlook. The Reserve Bank looks for material changes in the inflation uh, outlook. Uh, what we've seen today, and they will obviously assess these numbers in their own way, but what we've seen today uh, is consistent with our expectations. It doesn't materially change the inflation uh, outlook going forward. Jim Chalmers, he does seem more relaxed about that inflation read than uh, perhaps some um, others. Is he also, do you think, Anthony, trying to send a message to the Reserve Bank about what it should or shouldn't do? I read it less as sending a message and more uh, preparing for the fact uh, that uh, the cash rate might be raised on, on Cup Day. Everyone I'm talking to in the government is fully in preparation for, for, a, a, for a rate rise on Cup Day. So more distancing the government from the RBA already, so you can kind of say RBA is independent, um, it had nothing to do with us. I do like, think... Like they've said every rate rise. <laughs> exactly, exactly, but they're getting in very early this time. Um, I do think there was a problematic figure. Uh, for the government um, in the latest results. Uh, Non-tradable goods um, inflation is actually higher than tradable goods and services. So what does that mean? That means that domestic factors have to be at play. Of course external factors such as the oil price in Ukraine are at play, but it, it means that there are domestic factors at play. That's an inconvenient fact for the government.
Are we seeing a slightly different tone between the government and the Reserve Bank? Yeah, is it hopeful or is it yeah, trying to spin mm. the, the result that's coming? It just strikes me that the Prime Minister is having this international success and he's being fated by world leaders and described in the most remarkable terms here that he doesn't mm. enjoy in Australian politics. I think he joked even on his own side. But there is, there is this issue domestically he's going to go back to on cost of living, the, the failure of the referendum. There are a number of fronts that he sort of escaped by being over here that he'll be right back into for those few days before Beijing. And this yeah. is the headache for the government, Greg, isn't it? If inflation isn't coming down, if cost of living isn't coming down uh, enough heading into next year, if it's dragging right through next year, this gets tough. There's a moment of reinvention coming for the government off the back of the referendum, obviously. Now, it won't have escaped people's attention that Jim Chalmers, throughout the referendum campaign, kept emphasising our number one issue is always cost of living. But you're about to be tested on that, a new sort of narrative, new instruments of control. I'm not sure what it is, but we'll clear out this state stuff, foreign relations, all very important. Voice, done. But there is a moment of inflection or reinvention coming. How they do that, I'm not sure, because how many times have we discussed the, uh, the difficulties of, of fiscal policy uh, containing inflation? It's yeah. uh, almost impossible. No, it's a very good point, though. It is coming, uh, a turning point. All right, our panel, Greg Jennett, Anna Henderson and Anthony Galloway, will be back very shortly with some final observations. Time now for Mike Bowers and Talking Pictures. I'm Mike Bowers and I'm photographer at large for The Guardian Australia. I'm talking pictures this morning with columnist, author and broadcaster Antoinette Latouf and a very warm welcome. Hello, loving the specs. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> um, politics can be a lonely business but this week the uh, the PM went on to visit the great and powerful and it's it's quite a visual mm -hmm. pot puree, isn't it, when they go to the States? Absolutely is. But what we didn't expect was there to be so many photo opportunities for Kevin Rudd. He met him at the plane and, yes, he's been front and centre. Yeah, absolutely. And look, all I want to know in this interaction is who has the best dad jokes. Like, who's telling the knock-knock joke that has everybody bursting out laughing? I don't, I, I don't think it's K Rudd. I don't. I'm going to say it's Therese. Brett Lethbridge has picked up on that. I'm off to meet clearly the most important man in the United States. Well, he thinks he's the most important man. What I do love about Kevin Rudd is he's now sporting that kind of uni, mature age student beard. Do you think he manscapes it? I, I reckon he does whatever he can do to try and remain relevant. <laughs> The visuals are so mm. are so wonderfully rich when they go visit the United States. It's mm. hard for the opposition leader to compete when he's sort of doing a doorstop in suburban Brisbane. Absolutely, the usual pomp ceremony. Jill Biden here was the the pro. She's uh, mm -hmm. she's sort of got it arranged. It looks like Jody has uh, has stood on the wrong side. Yeah, she's she... telling the newbie over there. I've got this. <laughs> I did love this, David Pope. The boy stood on the burning deck. Uh, would this be a good time for the joint session to talk about submarines? A submarine deal which has been held up in Congress will maybe, hopefully, perhaps get Who through. Knows? Lovely Matt Golding. A time machine takes Albo to what federal election politics will look like in 2025. But looking at that, a private jet, a red carpet, it looks good to me. Where do I sign <laughs> yeah. up? Maybe I'll consider federal politics in 2025. Fiona Katowska says we all live in a yellow submarine. Troubled US waters, possible second Trump presidency ahead. Just for future reference, does this thing have an escape hatch? And 2023 hasn't been a good year for submarines. Yeah. Not for millionaires going on tours, not for multi-billion dollar deals, not for awful acronyms. I too would be looking for a way out. Mark Knight seems to think that he's uh, speed dating because he's going on, of course, to China next yes. week. Um, Elbow's week of speed dating, or it, let's Australianise it, speed mating. Oh, I love that, speed yeah. mating. There's the clock. Our five minutes is up. Better move on to my next date, Joe. Anyone I know? Oh, not anybody he likes. Biden said something to the effect of, like, trust but verify. What does that mean? I reckon it's about Instagram. That's yeah. what I'm putting it down right. to. I haven't got the blue tick. Yeah. Antoinette, a lovely John Cadelka, who's got the bromance here in the uh, gardens of the White House and, uh, and a little ode to John Howard. How about making my sidekick name Man of Uranium? Uh, this, of course, is a throwback to what President Bush said about John Howard in yep. 2003, Man of Steel. Man of Steel. Also relevant to the Iraqi war, going in for so-called yep. weapons of mass destruction. Yep. Albo's trying to make an impression. Do we need to amalgamate their names like all good celebrity romances? Yeah, like J-Lo and Ben Affleck have Bye -bye. Benifer. Biden easy. It won't be easy under Biden easy. Oh, I love that. 
actually around here we refer to you as the 368 billion dollar man yeah i did love this oh, this Livre. is so what's for dinner uh you you a very juicy looking albanese on a bed of lettuce who's going to get the biggest piece china or the us or the panda alb duck and pecking albanese <laughs> Antoinette, it's been a great pleasure unpicking the events this week with you. I'll let you do the honours. We may as well give David his show back, right? Yeah, yeah. Back to you, Swizzy. Thank you very much, Antoinette. Thank you, Mike. Let's get some final observations here in Washington. Anthony. I hate to make the story about journalists, but <laughs> our Prime Minister got up in the Rose Garden of the White House next to Joe Biden on Wednesday and bragged about how we all don't take follow-up questions. He later uh, um, bragged to, well, he later said to the um, Congress, uh, members of Congress that uh, the US press corps was a circus. He refused to take a follow-up from one of uh, the US uh, journalists. We can get into a debate about whether some of the, the tone of the um, questions of the last election was appropriate, but many of our colleagues think it's gone a bit too far and they've been a bit too polite. Oh, okay. So I think the Prime Minister can expect it. Um, a bit of muscling up from the bit, journos. A bit more feral from now okay. on, I think. So he described the US press corps uh, when he was at Congress as a circus, uh, and, and it was pretty offensive to members of the US media who heard about this. They didn't take it very well. Um, and from what I could hear from what they were yelling out, it was actually questions about the war, and they get very few opportunities to actually interact with the president. So, look, I, I mean, we as TV journalists um, got two questions each for our interviews, and it's quite hard to prosecute something in that. Uh, we've had a lot of opportunities with uh, prime ministers gone by to at least have five minutes of their mm. time. We always appreciate their time, but a little bit more is always welcome. My final observation, though, is there was a lot of speculation that Margot Robbie was going to attend the state dinner. Speculation <laughs> driven by one Anna Henderson <laughs> <laughs> and, and and the US uh, White House press were also expecting her to potentially come. Yep. They had it confirmed that she had declined the invitation and we don't know why. But the senior uh, Australian of the year, Indigenous Australian Tom Calmer, almost didn't make it too. He tells me that he got an email from uh, the embassy about an RSVP that he hadn't sent. He thought it was a hoax. He called the embassy and discovered the White House invitation had gone to his junk mail. Oh, wow. So <laughs> <laughs> well, just made it. As, as it turns out, I noticed the president spent quite a lot of time talking to Tom Karma at the uh, ceremonial welcome. Greg. Solidarity with the colleagues, but I'm going to take us in a completely different direction, David. Kevin Rudd update for those playing at home. There was great fear and trepidation when he was appointed ambassador to Washington. I think we all spent a fair bit of time in his orbit this week. And the breadth and depth of the doors that were open, the access given to the Prime Minister and the Australian delegation was pretty remarkable. Speaking of the dinner, by the way, 78 the honourables at that yeah. uh, function. So some celebrities missing, but most of those are current and a few yeah. former public officials. So yeah. some credit to the DFAT team here. Mm -hmm. uh, in some towns, just like this one, uh, it does pay, I think, to have uh, former politicians with all their bravado and chutzpah bursting through those doors in order to open them for Yeah, prime and, and worth noting, they were, I think, trying to tone down the, uh, the, the, the vibe at the state dinner from a party atmosphere, given all that's, uh, all that's going on. Look, uh, so wonderful to spend this beautiful Washington, Washington evening watching the sunset behind us and a beautiful moon rise as well that hopefully you get tonight back in Australia as well. Thank you all very much and thanks for joining us and big thanks to all the team here in Washington and back home for making this show happen. Finally, and appropriately, we're going to go out with a tribute to uh, one of this country's musical greats. Michael McCormack's well known for his Elvis routine, but we now have a rival for the title of Best Elvis Impersonator in the Australian Parliament. Take it away, Health Minister Mark Butler.